In this film, we'll cover maintenance of the Z1 engine. Attention will be focused on those areas which differ greatly from the two-cycle engine used on most Kawasaki motorcycles at present. This will include maintenance of the cylinder head, valve system, and lubrication system, and adjustment of the carburetors. We'll start off with a compression check. First, warm up the engine thoroughly to bring it to normal running condition. Check that there are no visible indications of compression or oil leakage, and that the cylinder head is tightened down with a specified torque. Remove all the spark plugs. and screw a compression gauge into one spark plug hole. Open the throttle fully and turn the engine over until the compression reading stops rising. Compression should be about 8.5 kilograms per square centimeter, that is about 120 pounds per square inch. And no two cylinders should be greatly different. If compression is bad, the camshafts, valves, cylinders, pistons, and piston rings must be checked. The easiest check is the valve clearance, which must be done when the engine is cold. Remove the gas tank and the valve cover and remove the right hand engine cover to get out a nut on the crankshaft that is used for turning the engine over manually. Turn the crankshaft until the lobe of the cam to be measured is pointing directly away from its valve lifter and measure the clearance between the cam and the lifter shim with thickness gauges. If the clearance is not between two and four thousandths of an inch, use the special tool to hold the lifter down and replace the lifter shim with a size that will correct the clearance. There are 21 different size shims available. The size of each shim is stamped on the shim with ink. From valve and seat wear or from valve grinding, clearance may become uncorrectable by changing shims. When this happens, the valve stem can be ground down a small amount to increase clearance. Each camshaft is held in place by two caps. The caps in the cylinder head are protected from wear by using split Babbitt metal bushings. If these bushings become too worn, the camshafts will become noisy, valve timing will change, and there will be a loss of compression at higher engine speeds. To measure wear, unbolt the camshaft, Insert a plastic gauge between each lower bushing and the shaft and bolt the shaft back down with a specified torque. Then take the bolts back out, remove the shaft, and measure the clearance using the plastic gauge table. If the clearance is excessive, the four bushing halves for that camshaft must be replaced as a set. No used bushings must be used together with new ones, and if the old bushings are still usable, they must be put back into the same place they were taken from. Next, we'll work with the cylinder head. Be sure to mark all of the lifters, shims, and valves when removing them so they can be put back into the original positions during reassembly. After pulling out the lifters and shims, compress the springs with a special purpose tool 
and take the split color off each valve stem. Then release the tool and take out the retainer, the valve springs and the valve. Carefully remove the oil seal from the end of the valve guide. The valves must be seated so that about a 3 64ths of an inch wide portion of the valve face touches the seat evenly around the entire seat. If the seating area is too wide, the pressure per square inch will be reduced and besides causing compression leakage, carbon may build up between the valve and seat and damage the seating surfaces. If the seating is too narrow, Heat transmission from the valve to the seat will be reduced and the valve will overheat and warp, again causing compression leakage. Compression loss will also occur any time the valve is not seated evenly. The valve seat is cast into the cylinder head and ground to fit the valve. There are three surfaces ground into the seat, 30 degrees, 45 degrees and 75 degrees. The valve seat is the center or 45 degree surface. Check whether or not the valve is bent or warped by placing it in V-blocks and turning it while measuring the runout with a dial gauge. If runout is over the service limit, the valve must be replaced. Measure the valve stem wear with a micrometer at the top of the travel area and at the bottom. Measure the diameter of each point in two directions at right angles from each other. Since the valve guide is quite small, it should be measured with a small bore gauge and micrometer. If worn beyond the service limit, the guide must be replaced. To remove or reinsert the valve guide, the head should be heated to about 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Removal and installation are made easier by using the valve guide punch from the special tool kit. Oversized guides are not available, so be careful not to damage the cylinder head during guide removal or installation. After installation, the guide bore must be reamed to size with a reamer supplied in the special tool kit. To check for correct valve seating, paint the valve seat surface with layout dye. Then with a lapping tool, tap the valve onto the seat. The part marked on the valve face is the seating area. When the valve or valve guide is replaced or if the seat is damaged, reseat the valve with a valve cutter. There are 30 degree, 45 degree and 60 degree valve cutters available. Since the intake and exhaust valves are different diameters, there are two sizes of 60 degree cutters. First grind the seating surface with a 45 degree cutter. Then use the 30 degree and 60 degree cutters to adjust the width of the seat. Be careful not to cut the 45 degree seat too much as this would leave less leeway for valve lifter clearance adjustment. Next the valve and seat must be lapped. Spread lapping compound on the valve and while tapping the valve lightly into place, turn the valve with a lapper until it is properly seated. 
When the valve or seat is only slightly damaged, or to remove dirt from the seat or valve, instead of grinding, lapping only will be sufficient. If the valve seat was ground down so much that later valve lifter clearance is found to be impossible, the valve stem will have to be ground down to increase lifter clearance. To seat the valves firmly and prevent chattering at high speeds, double springs are used on the valves. If the springs weaken or break, the valves will be noisy and will not close properly. One way to check for correct spring tension is to measure the free length of the springs with vernier calipers. If any spring measures less than the service limit, it should be replaced. There is an oil seal on the top of each valve guide to prevent oil from leaking past the valve stem into the ports. If this seal goes bad, the engine will start burning oil and carbon will build up in the cylinder head and valve areas. The oil seal should be replaced if it is split or otherwise damaged or if there is clearance between the valve stem and seal. Assembly is just the reverse of disassembly. Thoroughly wash all the parts before installation to remove metal particles and grinding compound. After installing the split collar, tap the valve stem end to ensure that the collar is fully seated. Next, we'll take a brief look at the pistons and rings. Aside from the fact that there is one extra ring to handle, piston and ring maintenance is the same as for a two-cycle engine, and so will not be covered in detail here. The rings can be removed easily with a special purpose tool. The top two rings are compression rings and work very much the same as in a two-cycle engine. The third ring is an oil ring. Its function is to keep the crankcase oil out of the combustion chamber. The oil ring scrapes the oil off the cylinder walls and returns it to the crankcase through the holes in the piston. All of the rings have a trademark on them and this mark must face up when the rings are installed. This completes inspection of all the major components of the compression system and brings us to investigation of the lubrication system. The Z1 has a wet sump type engine and transmission lubrication system consisting of an oil pump, oil filter, oil breather and their associated parts. Unlike the two cycle crankcase which is completely sealed so that primary compression can take place, the crankcase in the four cycle engine is not sealed to the atmosphere. The path for engine flow is as follows. The oil is picked up from the crankcase by the oil pump, pushed into the outside part of the filter, and after passing through the filter element to the center of the filter, goes into the engine. If the filter becomes too dirty and clogged, however, the oil may not get through easily, so to prevent engine damage from lack of proper lubrication, a bypass valve is located just ahead of the filter. From the filter or bypass valve, the oil goes past the oil pressure switch and into the three crankcase oil passages. One passage supplies oil to the crankshaft bearings and crank pins. Some of this oil drops directly back into the crankcase and the rest is flung out to the piston pin, cylinder walls and other parts and eventually this too drains back down into the crankcase.
The second path is divided into two, one at either end of the cylinder block, and the oil goes up into the top of the cylinder head, coming out through the crankshaft bearings to lubricate them. From the bushings, it flows down around the lifters and valve stems and drains through a hole from there back into the crankcase. The third path from the oil pump supplies oil directly to the transmission bearings and gears. The oil pump is located in the bottom of the crankcase and is a positive displacement gear type pump. No pump maintenance will be required as the pump will be sold as an assembly only. A crankcase breather is located on top of the engine for the purpose of relieving crankcase pressure and reducing the possibility of oil leaks or oil being forced past the piston rings. If oil from the breather enters the air cleaner, it will clog the paper element and restrict engine air intake. So inside the breather, there is a separator which separates the oil mist from the air. Only clean air is then drawn through the breather into the air cleaner. The oil filter is the cartridge type. As the element in the filter is gradually plugged by trapped dirt, its efficiency is reduced and so the element should be replaced after the first 500 miles, after 2,000 miles, and every 4,000 miles after that. If the oil filter does become so plugged that it will not allow any oil to pass through, oil pressure will force open a bypass valve. This will allow dirty oil to go around the filter into the engine, which will increase engine wear if prolonged, but dirty oil is better than no oil at all. An oil pressure switch is installed here to check oil pump condition. When oil pressure is low, the switch will close and turn on the oil pressure warning light. Either the switch or the plug may be removed to provide a point to check the oil pressure. The recommended oil is MS Class SAE 10W40 or 20W50 weight. If too heavy an oil is used or if too high an oil level is maintained, power output will be reduced. The clutch may slip and oil could be pulled into the air cleaner element through the breather, clogging the air cleaner. It is very important to check the oil level at least every 500 miles and to change the oil after the first 500 miles after 2,000 miles and every 2,000 miles thereafter. After any major carburetor work or after the replacement of a complete carburetor, some adjustments will be necessary. While the carburetors themselves are very much like those on our other models, disassembly or adjustment of the linkage will be new. If the idle adjust screw, carburetor throttle stop screw, or the air screw is maladjusted, the engine idle will be unstable, engine response to the throttle will be poor, and there will be a drop in performance. Before trying to make a good idle adjustment, check lifter clearance, engine oil level, the spark plugs, ignition timing, and cylinder compression. When carburetors are replaced, or when idle adjustment is especially rough, it may be necessary to make a preliminary adjustment before starting on the idle adjustment. And for this adjustment, a special purpose tool is provided. With the carburetors removed, loosen the lock nut and turn the adjusting screw with a special tool so that there is 20 thousandths of an inch clearance between the notch cut into the throttle valve and the bottom of the carburetor throat. This is a very fine adjustment, so make it carefully for each carburetor and tighten the lock nut.
Turn in the air screw of each carburetor fully, but not tightly, and then back it out one and a half turns. Start the engine and warm it up for about five minutes, and then adjust engine idle with the main idle adjust screw so that idle speed is about 1,000 RPM by the tachometer. Adjust the air screw of each carburetor, one at a time, first turning it in one direction and then in the other until the point of highest idle is determined. If idle RPM rises too much during air screw adjustment, lower it with the main idle adjust screw. If any carburetor air screw can be turned into less than one half turn from full in without idle speed changing, there is probably trouble within that carburetor. From the point of highest idle, Turn all four air screws in a small equal amount and then readjust idle speed to about 1000 RPM. Remove the rubber caps from the vacuum gauge attachments on the cylinder head and attach the vacuum gauges. With the engine running at idle speed, close down each vacuum gauge intake valve until the gauge needle flutters less than two centimeters of mercury. Normal vacuum gauge reading is 20 to 23 centimeters of mercury. If any gauge reads less than 15 centimeters, Check that the carburetor hose clamps and spark plugs are tight and recheck the points mentioned earlier. If there is a variation in vacuum readings among the different cylinders, readjust the individual throttle stop screws to set all the carburetors to within two centimeters of mercury of each other. Backing the screw out decreases vacuum and turning it in increases it. For any carburetors readjusted, Readjust the air screw as explained previously.